it's great to be here. I'm, I'm not quite a OFC virgin. Uh, I came uh, five or six years ago, but uh, it's great to be back. And I actually think this is the beginning of one of those eras. I was just talking to the chairs, and they said uh, during the bubble years, which in optics probably you talk about in hushed tones, uh, there were 40,000 people at OFC. I think we might be entering an era where we get back up to those numbers, but not with the irrational and perhaps uh, not entirely transparent selling of optics that was done in that time, but actually with rational transparent selling, because the, the, we're entering an era, and it's sort of the title of my talk about deterministic networking, where the properties of optical networking, optical switching actually come to the fore to enable very low latency, very high capacity, lowest cost per bit transport uh, for, for the next era. So I think we're really standing on the verge of that era, and it's a very exciting time for me to be here. I am a jack of all trades, master of none. So you'll get uh, occasional moments where it looks like I know what I'm talking about, but uh, don't be fooled. Uh, what my job is, is actually to chart the future of the company, Nokia, that's the CTO role. But then the Bell Labs role is to help match that to the innovation needed. And so I'm gonna show you a bit of both views of the world. One which is about the evolution of the market and in fact, human needs of what we need to do to actually enable a new human existence. That's sort of the CTO role in some ways. And then I'll show you plenty of uh, Bell labs -y type stuff that you'll hear much more from all the Nokia Bell Labs presenters. But I'll show you where, how we're thinking. And we're, you know, we're a very transparent organization where we like to show exactly how we see the world uh, to stimulate a dialogue on this topic. So I hope this talk stimulates a dialogue about the future of optics and the tremendous potential uh, for optical networking in the coming decades. So the, the key here is going to be we're going to create new value. And I'm going to talk about how we create new value and why optics is essential to that. So I'm going to start with a depressing story with the clicker. There. The, so this is uh, the uh, depressing story. This is a, a plot from a book by Robert Gordon. It was called The Rise and Fall of American Growth. And it's depressing because it says there is no interesting future for anything. That's roughly what the, the book says. It's not very positive. What it says is in the first and second industrial revolutions, uh, there was an increase in productivity. This is productivity growth rate. So actually, it's a, it's a rate increase. So you see, everything goes up quite nicely. And, and in the internet age, the third industrial revolution, the web era, it's essentially attenuated. It's still growth. These are still positive numbers. But, uh, but it's attenuated to the point where it's asymptotically approaching zero. And that's very depressing. So in what Gordon surmises, it might be that way forever because perhaps we're never going to innovate at the same level as we did during the physical eras of the first and second industrial revolutions. Now, what I'm going to try and convince you of is that that's not true, but we, we now have to innovate in a digital way that actually is about coupling physical to digital, and then that's where the new era of productivity is going to come about. It does lead to things like AI and robotics, but I'm going to tell you that story as we go. So that's the depressing part. But if we can solve for this, then, in fact, of course, it's eminently reasonable we'd get back to the high levels of productivity. Now, if you look at that productivity number for the peak of the Industrial Revolution, it's somewhere around 3%. Now, I'm going to show you where web-based businesses are in terms of uh, productivity. So here we go. This is a plot here from a, a paper by a, a group of CEOs, uh, telecom CEOs. And what you see is at the top, digital industries are actually increasing their productivity by about 2.7% per annum. And they're spending 70% of the IT spend is in those industries. So think of those as the web scale companies, as well as uh, many of the advanced media companies. Down below is where physical industries are. Conventional manufacturing, you can think of uh, cities and hospitals and, uh, and uh, manufacturing processes and mining processes, et cetera, all in that bottom category. And you see their productivity is right down at that bottom level, that asymptotically to 0.7% productivity. So the trick, and you see how little they spend on infrastructure, the IT spend, think of it as digital networking infrastructure, about 30% they spend uh, on that relative to the 70% spend in digital industry. So the trick, the trick to solve that, that depressing Robert Gordon scenario is to find a way that we digitize these physical industries and then drive them to new productivity growth. So the way to sort of summarize it is this way, and this is the value part of the talk, so you see how big the value is we could create. On the left is what our industry is currently. It's stagnant at about $1 trillion uh, total across the entire ICT segment. Right. In the middle is the rise of cloud, and you see it's approaching half a trillion already. 
as, as an industry. So right there shows the potential for growth that comes from relatively z close to zero, and we've got to something that is already half a trillion, but that's not really our industry at the moment. We network that industry, but with that, that cloud business is not uh, in the telecom sector. The last part is really interesting. It's a study by McKinsey, McKinsey Global Institute, which does sort of the analysis for McKinsey, and they point out that the digitization of physical industries, and some of them are listed there, is, has a tremendous potential for new value. And it's essentially a combination of cloud and network, and I'll show you why that is. Uh, on the high side, the estimate they make is about $11 trillion of new value creation. And on the low side, they say $4 trillion. So let's assume 10% of that went into the networking part. Right? So, and let's pick a number between those, so that would be somewhere around $7 trillion. Take 10% of that, and you've got seven you know, you've got a, a very large number. You've got something on the order of 10%, you've got 700 billion. It's a very big number that then almost doubles the size of our industry, which is one trillion. So let's call it, we have the potential to almost double the size of the networking industry by networking these new sort of industrial uh, complexes that we're trying to turn them from physical and inefficient to digital and highly optimized and efficient. So that's the quest we're on as a company, as an industry. And if we get this right, there's huge growth, and particularly in the optical networking domain, which I'll highlight, okay? So that's the quest. So I like to put it in another sort of more humanistic term, because productivity is a bit bland as a term, but actually you can reduce it to time. Productivity is just the number of goods you produce per unit time. So if I can decrease the time spent, my productivity intrinsically goes up if I'm producing the same number of goods. And of course, the goal is to produce more goods in even less time. So this concept of time is interesting because it actually allows you to understand value. Any system or platform or product that allows you to save time has intrinsic value. The problem we have in our industry, and this is why I like to use this, is we, when we were back in the telecom, traditional telephony, telegraph, the origins of Bell Labs, we were actually quite high up the stack because if you look at this, this thing's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, but we were roughly at the middle of the stack in value because what we did was we connected people. We connected them so they felt esteem and belonging and love, et cetera, and those are higher order value propositions. But we've actually lost that value. This is where we are now. That's the value of our industry uh, by perception in the consumer segment. The trick is if we actually build this new dynamically networked deterministic networking of physical infrastructure, we had to go way back up the value uh, stack. And, and probably more in the enterprise or industrial segment, consumer will remain, I think, the proven, provenance of, of the web scale businesses. But the growth is in this other segment. Now, that doesn't mean to say consumers won't benefit, but they'll be benefiting from industrial type services. Think of them as digital healthcare, digital energy management, digital, digital task management for some of the mundane tasks in their lives. And what, what uh, what uh, Maslow's hierarchy says about humans is we want to spend less time at the bottom of the hierarchy, which are considered mundane tasks, and we want to uh, spend more time at the top of the hierarchy. So that's where time comes in. So just think of it as a time-saving device. You can think of it in industrial terms as productivity, but as humans, uh, the quest is to save time. And we, as an industry, have to move up this stack, and I'm going to show you how we do that, because what's going to happen is the cloud has to move into the network. Device functionality has to move into that combined cloud network, and that's where the nexus of new value is going to be. So why is that? Now, I'm going to start in the wireless domain. I, I uh, told you I was a jack of all trades and master of none, so I know something about wireless. Now, wireless is, of course, very relevant in the optical domain because of so-called any-haul technologies that are appearing to backhaul or front-haul or mid-haul uh, base stations. Uh, and, of course, some of those are PON technologies. Some of them are more conventional optical and WDM technologies. It's relevant there, but it's also relevant because it's the thing that pumps traffic into the network. And so I'm going to speak a little bit about where 5G is going so you understand the potential capacity growth at the edge, which then will inform how much has to actually impinge upon the optical network. So this is where we are today. And I like to use these triangles of truth. You'll see one in a little while for optics, but this, this is the one for wireless. So you have three dimensions you can use to, get, to jam capacity down uh, or across a medium. You have spectrum, you have uh, spectral efficiency, and you have space. And you're gonna see the same themes come uh, when I talk about the optical domain. So where are we in wireless? Well, we've actually exhausted most of the spectrum that is easy to use or is available. And that's all the spectrum below 
a couple of gigahertz, typically. We've got maybe 2x left. If, if, we, uh, if we re-farm spectrum from 3G onto LTE, if we free up some of the 600 megahertz band, you remember that the incentive auction the FCC ran, that was all about freeing up some spectrum in 600 megahertz. So there might be um, another 100 megahertz uh, you could have available to complement roughly 100 megahertz that operators have today. Each operator has about 100 megahertz of spectrum. So you get another 100, that's 2x. But 2x doesn't get me very far in a world where I need to build uh, massive amounts of digital connectivity. Shannon, we've actually solved for the Shannon limit with advanced MIMO technologies, coherent multipath processing, which means cell towers coordinate to, to manage the interference cancellation. So with, within a factor of two, we're probably actually within a factor of 1.5 uh, in the wireless domain. So we've been as clever in wireless as we have in optics. And it's no coincidence because the two leverage each other. So we've actually only got about a factor of four left in the wireless domain. So if that were true, if that were true, then uh, don't build any new optical networks because there's no more capacity coming. But in fact, it's not true, because there's one dimension we haven't fully exploited in wireless. It's the spatial dimension, which is the idea of small cells. And you've started seeing the rise of small cells, and you can think of Wi-Fi access points as a, as a type of small cell. But what's interesting about if, I, if I'm willing to go close, if I'm willing to go to small cells, the following can happen. You see at the top there. I can actually open up a new spectrum band, and that's, uh, there's a couple of things I can, I can, I can do. One is I can open up what's called a mid, the mid-band, 3.5 gigahertz. In fact, by being clever, I can actually do that on the existing grid, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because that's going to be a big deal in 5G. But I can go to high band, I can go to millimeter wave. Millimeter wave is anywhere from 20 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. In fact, it even now goes beyond 100 gigahertz. So I've just told you two numbers, 20 to 100 gigahertz. So we've got 80 gigahertz of spectrum that is sort of available. Yes, it needs to be licensed, uh, et cetera, made available, but it's roughly available, about 80 gigahertz of spectrum, compared to the one gigahertz I've been using, right? maybe two gigahertz. So you see, there's my gain. I've got a factor of 10 or 20 in spectrum, but it only propagates, if I use access levels of power, a couple of hundred meters. So if I'm willing to go close to that spatial dimension, I can now use that millimeter wave spectrum, and suddenly I open up at least a factor of 10 or 20 uh, more in spectral bandwidth. There's one more trick. You saw I, I changed the spectral efficiency number as well to 5x down that bottom left-hand corner as you look at it. That's one thing we haven't done in wireless is beamforming. We actually sort of spread the energy out in 120 degree sectors. That's why cell towers look the way they do. They look a bit triangular and you see you know, 120 degree sectors. It really wasn't worth doing any beamforming. They actually did a bit of vertical sectorization where it would point far and near, but the signal scatters so much that in the end you didn't get any gain. But if I go close and I use millimeter wave spectrum where I have to actually form beams to actually penetrate any distance, I get beamforming gain. I get signal to noise gain because I focus the energy. So massive MIMO is about using mid-band spectrum, about 3.5 gigahertz. That's why this is such important spectrum in, in around the world. Because a massive MIMO can have small antennas, right? We all know antenna size is inverse of frequency because it's related to wavelength. So I can get a, a massive array, 64 elements in something like this. And I can, get, um, I can get very high throughputs. And I've got 100 megahertz of spectrum there. And I can do it on my existing grid. So the interesting part is I can put it on an existing cell tower, form a beam because I get my SINR up. And I can reach you where you are today and possibly give you 10 times as much bandwidth on mid-band. If I then add in millimeter wave, I can give you another factor of 10. So everything I've said so far, so this is the evolution of wireless. I'm gonna use mid and high band spectrum. I'm gonna use beam forming and I'm gonna use FTTX to backhaul that, as well as conventional WDM technologies. And I might get, if I, if I do the multiplex across that, 500 times more capacity. Possibly 5x from beam forming, 10x from spectrum, 10x from going closer and subdividing how I use that spectrum. So 500 times, big deal, okay? So that's how much capacity could be impinging on the backhaul network and then the optical network because that all has to be sent somewhere, which is gonna be to this edge cloud. So let me talk about edge cloud. Why are, are clouds gonna go to the edge? And this is the reason why. Many of the new services, and I'll talk about a few of them, have very low latency requirements. The industrial services, but it actually happens to be the network VNFs as well as the VR, AR services have very low latency. Latency on the order of a millisecond. We've built networks that essentially have uh, about 100 milliseconds of latency because it's human perception time. Your brain roughly takes 100 milliseconds 
to process and perceive something. So we built networks that were that way because we built them based on telephony principles, right? People seeing and hearing speech and sound. Uh, but now in these industrial era, one millisecond latency becomes a common requirement. So that means speed of light tells me, and you of all people should know this, I can only be 100 kilometers away round trip to get there and back in a millisecond. Whereas before I could be 10,000 kilometers away with 100 millisecond latency. So my control plane, my control plane, my application function, et cetera, can only be 100 kilometers away. So this slide tells you from a wireless perspective, but it's true for all services, because on top of the wireless domain are the services, of course. Uh, I can only be 100 kilometers away from my control plane, and my nodes are going to be maybe 100 meters away. And that's the evolution of, and that's 5G. 5G in a, in a snapshot is, is this. So that's the edge cloud. Let me show you the services briefly. The most interesting thing here is the top right quadrant where it says VR, VRAN, and vehicles. Those are the ones that need low latency to autonomously control things, to closely follow where the position of something is. Positioning is a big deal in terms of low latency. I need regular updates to know where something is. But I also need it for the network itself, and so I'm actually gonna focus on that one. This is the one that makes it unavoidable in some way. If I want to virtualize my wireless network control plane, because it's an unreliable medium, it has a protocol in wireless called hybrid ARQ. It's like a TCP type protocol that does a resend and an ACK. And that ACK needs to come back in four milliseconds. And if I virtualize the entire base station over a, a link called a CIPRI link, where I'm actually doing digital samples and I, I move them back to the cloud, I need 300 microseconds of latency because actually that's a digital sampled medium where it's basically taking the whole radio signal back sampled and sending it all the way back to the radio and just launching it. And that's a very tightly timing controlled interface. So I need very low latency and I actually need high capacities to, to do digital sampling. So, so that's one of the reasons why we're gonna build these very distributed cloud architectures is actually for virtualization of the network itself. And what makes that interesting is the same location I need for industrial control processes and VR processes, because your brain actually does have a perception thing where if you move your head in a VR headset, you will see, you'll feel sick, or you have a sort of vertigo function. That is one of the things that needs very low latency control on the order of a few milliseconds. So that top right quadrant is where we have to go, and we've been in the bottom left quadrant. So that's a big change, okay? And in fact, if I go to the top right, we all know it's easy to go to the bottom right and it's easy to go to the top left because they're actually easier than the top right. So the new value is those three segments. And the old value, the world we're leaving, the consumer segment is the bottom left segment. Right? So this is the mandate for high capacity, low latency that we have to build networks for that. And that's a very different network. How different? This different. If we were centralized relatively before, we went through a hierarchy of access network, metro network, core network to cloud, we're now going to sort of invert that. And the cloud is gonna appear within 100 kilometers of the end user, possibly 50 kilometers, maybe even 20 for some of the wireless technologies. Uh, and the network from that cloud to the edge is gonna be very high capacity, very high performance. So everything sort of collapses down to being hyper-local. And how big is the change? I've already alluded to it, but in nearly every dimension, there's a hundredfold change. 100-fold more bandwidth, very likely, due to all the services we need to support. 100-fold lower latency, 100-fold or more, more devices, and that's actually one of the drivers of virtualization of the wireless network, is the control plane needs to scale for IoT. Uh, much like uh, ASICs in optics, there's the bearer processing part and there's the control plane part. The IoT control plane is very different in scale from the bearer because there's very little data in many services but lots of control plane. So we have to separate those two things. Uh, we need to have battery lives on the order of 10 years. Most sensors are assumed to be uh, just left out there and unpowered. Think of a parking sensor. You're not going to run a power cable to that, uh, and, and it can't be solar powered if it's in a covered area. So many sensors need to have 10-year battery life. And I need the cost of these devices to be a dollar. Uh, so in fact, I'm going to, what does that say? It says I'm going to put a lot of the processing functionality in the network. Where am I going to put it? I'm going to put it in that edge cloud so the device actually moves into the into the network function as well, because it's where I can do the analytics, the security services, et cetera. So if I put it all together in a more structured way, this is how we see the future of networks. But the most interesting part, so this is a hierarchy of all the things that matter for value. You see security, digital value platforms are the new applications. Cognition systems is sort of the AI systems. You've then got the exposure layer. You've got setting up network paths, and then you've got the network infrastructure underneath it. But here's the thing. This is what I want you to take away. 
the nexus of new value is that low part. And in fact, you see I'm pointing to those edge clouds. Those edge clouds are where the entire application function has to be implemented for any of those low latency services. So don't think of it as just being the network function. It's the analytics function, it's the security function, it's the application function to respect the low latency. So the, the network of the future is, is a dynamically networked, highly deterministic set of edge clouds. And that's where this smart network fabric, which is our term for sort of the optical networking and transport part, uh, comes in and has such an important role to play. Okay, so its role is to network a distributed array of, of uh, edge cloud architectures that are actually dynamically hosting and, and adapting to changing application demands. So I'm gonna now spend a, the last uh, 10 minutes or so on the optics part. But just a note on access. One of the very interesting things happening in access, and I know there's a lot of pawn work that is discussed uh, at OFC, is all access technologies are becoming the same in terms of their architecture and even their signal processing. So on the left there is twisted pair. Think of that as DSL, which has now evolved to something called G.fast, which is just higher order vectoring and more spectrum uh, added to twisted pair. In the middle is cable, which is evolving to a distributed access architecture with much uh, nodes that are much closer to the end user. And then you've got the wireless evolution I've just talked about going to within 100 meters of the end user as well. So if you look at them all, they all now have fiber going to a node that is 100 to 200 meters away from the end user. The digital signal processing is actually very similar. There's a Fourier transform uh, logic in there. There's the effect blocks. There's the same, similar modulation schemes, similar OFDM symbols. So in fact, all those technologies are, are converging to the same technology at the same location, and all that changes is how you launch it, sort of the phi changes in each case. And look, so it shouldn't be any surprise that they're all now becoming bandwidth equivalent. So just be aware of that, because in fact that's how you will be able to get access over many different media and it'll all look the same. But now let's do the optical part. So I've made this comment about determinism. So this is data at the top there for what a typical data center uh, latency distribution looks like as a function of load. And you see it's in microseconds, so it's quite good, uh, but it's only in the data center part between is east-west uh, between servers and a data center. You see, however, the distribution has a very long tail at high loads. And this is the thing that actually is gonna become the tricky part, because think of an industrial service. Industrial service that has a critical one millisecond timer doesn't tolerate that long tail. It's not a best effort consumer service anymore, where that actually looks great to a consumer, because it's still only 250 microseconds. It's, it doesn't look great to an industry at all. So what we need to get to is the thing at the bottom left. We actually need to get to absolute deterministic low latency performance for industrial services, and that's where optics is gonna play a key role. At the same time, we have this. The total traffic in data centers is exceeding the, uh, the evolution of switching capacity and interface rates. So that's the challenge. So we've got this very low latency, and we've got this very high capacity we're gonna have to build to. You see the red line exceeds all the blue lines, and the blue lines are the essential interface and switching capacities currently. So we've got a challenge there. So here's how you have to meet that challenge. What we need to do is maximize capacity, we need to minimize the latency, but we have to do that with optimizing the total cost of ownership per bit because we can't do it at infinite cost. In fact, we want to do it at minimum cost per bit, but cost has both capex and opex. That's what TCO is. And then we actually, the only way we're gonna achieve that is by automation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about automation because that's the other very interesting evolution. Instead of set and forget optical networks, the era of dynamic automation is upon us. Okay, so that's the, what I'm gonna talk about uh, in the last part of the talk. So let's start. This, I'm gonna start on the optimized TCO per bit, and you're gonna see this slide later uh, in our booth. It's a very good slide. It says, look, it looks great, but then read the axis. The vertical axis is complexity. <laughs> you think it's, it's capacity, but it's actually complexity. Uh, and then the horizontal axis is, is capacity. Our problem is with all the innovations that we pioneered together, uh, starting with uh, all the coherent and the advanced modulation, CDC, Rotoms, et cetera, and now adding L-band, is we've increased complexity of managing these things whilst the capacity's gone up. So the, the, the quest we're on is this. We have to actually increase the capacity and this time bring down the complexity. And that's gonna be absolutely key. So many of the things you're going to see me talk about now, uh, we've got to automate how we are, are able to actually manage these networks. Because think of it this way, and I'm gonna show you data a little bit later, 
this thing called network slicing that you've probably heard a lot about, but think of it as just virtual private services. It's a much easier way to think about it, all the way from the application to the end device. But that application you don't know anything about because it's not yours, it's owned by an industrial. You just have to own and manage that based on its, its performance, and you have to sense that performance. You've got to optimize that continuously, and there might be hundreds of thousands of such flows you're dynamically managing. This is not a manual task anymore. This is an automated task. So let me do the triangle of truth for optics, and I'm gonna talk about each of the parts of the triangle here. This is how Bell Labs looks at the, the problem, at least uh, my summary of it. There's three dimensions again, spectrum, spectral efficiency, and space. So what I'm gonna talk about is solving for all three, because in fact the capacity as you see in the middle there is essentially the product of the three and a logarithm of SINR. So I'm gonna talk about approaching the Shannon limit, and that's the SINR dimension, but that's logarithmic, so it has gain, but it's not as big a gain as going beyond erbium limits in bandwidth and going beyond spatial limits in fiber. So those are the three dimensions we're playing with in Bell Labs uh, to, and you'll hear many more if you attend the wonderful Bell Labs talks. That's my only pitch for the Bell Labs guys. Uh, but we're gonna look at that, and I'll show you a summary of what we're doing, and hopefully you'll understand how it fits in this larger context. So. You've heard a lot about our work on PCS, probabilistic constellation shaping. We see it as sort of the end of, of the coherent puzzle uh, and the final piece where we've done everything we can in board rates, we've done everything we can in orders of modulation, although those keep increasing in the lab. We've got advanced coding schemes and software-defined FEC, and we've got nice Nyquist filtering. But what we didn't have was dynamic adaptation, and that's essentially what PCS is about. And to understand the value of PCS, it's this. I think many of you are aware of this by now. The problem with current networks is they, they are, are fixed in terms of the modulation scheme and the distance. You pick a modulation scheme for the, for the distance you have and the, and the SINR of that link, but that isn't dynamic and that isn't continuous, right? That allows me to move between four quantized states and then look at all the inefficiency of what's in between those. The idea of PCS is, is to dynamically adapt the modulation scheme to fit the link and do that continuously, possibly on a thousand symbol at a time sort of frequency. So very fast, rapid processing and recomputation of the right modulation scheme to use for the data coming in for the link that you're trying to impinge over. And I, rather than just talk about it, and you see you get two gains. One is you either get more capacity at a given distance or you get longer distance at a given capacity. And the, the gains are on the order of 25%, not world changing at some level because 25% isn't two or 10 but it is taking us to the Shannon limit, is essentially perfecting that SINR dimension, but it has a logarithm in there. But let, so you want to understand it, I've got a nice little video. Here it goes. This is what PCS is. You see, you basically trade capacity for reach, but you do it for the optimum point. I've got a, a link of a certain uh, distance. I can actually completely scale the, uh, the uh, modulation scheme dynamically to maximize the utilization of that link. If the link is shorter, I can maximize it for that distance. If it's longer, I can maximize it for that. And when we build this, we build this into a chip. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, complex function to dynamically map that at the speed that we map it. These are the gains we're beginning to see, and you'll, you can uh, show up at our booth and we'll explain how these gains map. But it's much lower cost per bit, which is remember that one of those TCO uh, challenges we had. We've got 2.4 times the capacity we can achieve per wavelength by embedding in a high-performance chip, and uh, the interface density goes up by a comparable amount. So PCS really does solve an important 2x problem because it allows us to create a highly optimized dense solution with 600 gigahertz, uh, 600 gigabit per second wavelengths multi-carrier solution. So come to our booth and find out about that. But I just wanted to highlight PCS. Now I want to talk about the B and the M dimensions. So B, solving for bandwidth. The other thing we've been working on is wideband optical amplification. Uh, you know that the standard uh, EDFAs uh, operating in C-band have a certain bandwidth profile shown there. We've been working for years and years on trying to actually finally build an SOA that actually has large bandwidth. There it is. Uh, it covers S, C, and L-band, and if you don't believe that it exists, uh, that's a, a trial we did of, uh, between two European data centers, and we got 115 terabit per second operating across C, S and L, which is really quite an accomplishment. So that gives me B bandwidth, where I've got a factor of two or three. So maybe I've got a factor of 25% gain from, from PCS, and now I've got a factor of two or three uh, in bandwidth for B. But there's one more dimension, M. So the other dimension was space, right? Remember that my triangle of truth, here's the spatial dimension. We all know the previous work that's been published at OFC and ECOC uh, 
on multi-core fibers. And we've been looking at multi-core fibers, and in fact, we actually did a transmission experiment down four coupled mode, uh, a four-core coupled mode fiber, where we uh, managed to achieve 12,000 kilometers of transmission with uh, eight by eight MIMO uh, processing, and uh, it got 25% more reach than the four individual fibers. So that, that's a, the type of gain you can get, and at 12,000 kilometers, that's pretty impressive. On the right is then the other approach of actually having a multi-mode fiber where we actually use the mode the modes themselves to actually carry uh, distinct information and then separate the modes as they, as they couple. I'm not going to say much more about that because I think it might be an OFC uh, post-deadline post paper later. But we are managing to get now terabits per second down at least a couple of kilometers of fiber using these, uh, these photonic lantern type approaches that couple into uh, a multi-mode fiber. So that's the M dimension. So if I summarize it all, and then I'll finish on automation, this is where we are today. We're at one dot possibly, in other words, we have uh, one carrier that has, uh, is a single mode fiber, one wavelength down one fiber, uh, with full PCS implementation, so we're at the Shannon limit, and I can now do a terabit per second. Of course, I can multiplex up wavelengths. So how many wavelengths can I multiplex? I can multiplex now possibly 100 of those cells, so think of those as wavelengths. And I can then, and that's my B dimension, I can optimize my PCS so I get my Shannon limit, and I can optimize my M dimension, which is space. So we see a path from going from a terabit per second per fiber to a petabit per second by using a combination of wideband, WDM, and wide spatial mode diversity, uh, which gets us to a petabit per second, which is fantastic, because remember I said there might be 500 times more bandwidth being pumped in that wireless network. And now here I've got a solution that gives me a factor of 1,000 in, in optical bandwidth, okay? And I can dynamically manage it to, a, to adapt to that. So let's just finish on talking about dynamic management, because it's a critical topic. If we build set and forget networks, they will be over capacity and too high a cost to be affordable. Wireless networks are beginning to be dynamically managed. We have to do the same in optics. So here's the problem. I've mentioned it already. This thing called network slicing is basically a way that I set up virtual private services with parameters like uplink and downlink capacity, the reliability, the latency, and the cost target I have for that connection. So you see all these different parameters. But if I, if I just sort of sum them up, I've got maybe four slice types across critical industries. Then I have the specific values of each of those slices for each of those services, and I've got thousands of, of different industries that I'll be serving over my network. So it's a problem on order of 20,000 in sort of the optimization order of magnitude. That is actually beyond what any human can process. There's quite a bit of work that shows that humans stop being intelligent uh, after three, the 3,000 repetitions. They are essentially an autopilot. And so this was framed by a guy called Moravec uh, in an interesting way, and, and I think it's a, a, an important way to think about this. Machines are actually good at tasks that humans are bad at. That's what he said. And, and the opposite also true. Humans are good at tasks that machines are bad at. And he pointed out they, they have a, sort of have a genetic basis. Uh, machines are really bad at things that we're good at, which are the things us moving and living in our physical world, we're actually really good at that. We were made for that, we evolved for that. But we were not good at actually mathematical computation. That was a more recent evolution, and we're not good at that. And machines are essentially better at that. We may formulate the problem correctly, but the computational part, we're relatively inefficient. And he says that will always be the way, at least on human evolution timescales. And there's a, Steven Pinker has a similar comment that uh, the main lesson of 35 years of AI is that the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. So, but remember what I said. Machines are good at scale problems. That's the key thing. So here we've been looking at where AI plays in networking. Right? And where it plays in networking is wherever there's a high scale problem. In fact, it's actually where they generally plays as a rule. So wherever the computation complexity is 3,000 or more, that, that's that. It's a sort of rule of thumb, there's no hard proof of this, but you can show that humans, in fact, the data I saw most recently, someone was given a data entry task, day one of the job. After 3,000 repetitions, they, they never improved. They improved initially, and then after that, they are no better at data entry after that. And, and machines, of course, continually learn in that sense. So if it's a high-scale, repetitive task of computation, that's a machine task. If it's a low-scale, human task, that's, that should stay in the human domain. And in fact, the right answer is a bit of both. And that's what we call augmented intelligence. So where this goes, in our view, and this is uh, my last slide, is the future of networks is this. And this is sort of the, the strategy for, for uh, Nokia as well in, in optical networking. 
we, we sort of fix our channel size, we pick 75 gigahertz because it matches the board rates we can achieve. You then have that PCS and, and slicing function that automatically tunes. You do real-time analytics of what's happening in the network by actually having AI monitoring functions, looking at the flows across the network, and then you do dynamic optimization in the following way. And if you do this, if you combine all those things, and you see how PCS becomes central to it because it gives me a degree of freedom, as does the spatial diversity of SDM, as does the wavelength uh, 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 spectral bandwidth of, of the broadband amplifier or the wideband amplifier, I can actually achieve around roughly 30% lower total cost of ownership, which was my goal in the first place. I had to have that optimized TCO per bit, but it's only by combining these elements and having all those degrees of freedom I can achieve that goal. Okay, so that's sort of the summary. Hopefully you've got a very quick tour the new values about digital productivity and essentially saving time. The new architecture is massively distributed, both in the bearer part and the control plane part, and then we need networks to dynamically manage that. And in the end, the only way we solve for this is highly automating and optimizing networks so they essentially become autonomous. So that's the end of my talk. Hopefully you found it interesting. All the detail behind what I've said uh, is uh, contained in the talks given by the, the Bell Labs team and at our booth. So thanks very much for your time. <laughs>